Welcome everyone. Today on Chai with AI, I have with me Nima Azarayin and Angela Radcliffe, and we are going to be doing a little bit of a conversation on healthcare today. Um, I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry. Angela has been in the healthcare industry for a very long time, and Nima is our resident scientist at Mobius. You can tell he's a scientist based on his haircut and his mustache <laughs> and his glasses. Um, so healthcare is the conversation, um, and we wanted to just start to get everyone fluent with this idea of AI and healthcare, whether it's new business models, new sets of data mastery, um, new models itself, or culture readiness. So healthcare is the conversation. Um, we are looking at different use cases in healthcare today. Um, we're gonna keep it fluid. Uh, we have not um, prepped any of these use cases, so Ange and, uh, and uh, Nima are in for a show here. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start some of the conversations around use cases. So I will, I will just seed one that I have picked up uh, the other day. I think this is the Mayo Clinic. Um, and the Mayo Clinic uh, has about three individuals who are absolute world-class experts at listening to someone's voice and figuring out whether you have ALS or not. Angela was a disease ALS, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, I think that's correct, um, Lou Gehrig's disease. Right. And so if you are in a certain part of the world, um, you don't have access to these three individuals because they are absolute experts and they are in Rochester, Minnesota. So uh, at the Mayo Clinic, um, they used uh, 10,000 voices to train a model um, and used uh, individuals to fine tune that model to be able to build a mobile app where now anyone in the world can put their voice into the mobile app and you can get a pretty good idea about whether you're predisposed to this disease or not. Now, I know there's been a lot of talk about co-pilots for doctors and about in silico discovery of drugs, but this is one of those situations where you don't think about a certain thing as digitizable. You don't think about voice as digitizable, right? All of us are thinking about text only, but the truth is anything that is digitizable could be mapped, could be modeled, could be simulated and could be generated, right? So I want to start the conversation there, like that's a healthcare use case. And there are so many other use cases of just using voice. Ange, you've been in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, tell me about the most interesting healthcare use case that you're looking at as it relates to AI. Cool. Man, it's hard to pick the most interesting use case. Boy, it's gotta be using generative AI to look at and create completely different ways of discovering drugs. So if we are talking about, you know, uh, the traditional ways of doing things, we thought it was revolutionary to have high throughput screening, right? Oh, let's look at things, you know, time and time over, let's use technology, this is amazing. <clears throat> you can see it in all the, the big pharma labs, right? These great high throughput screening machines. But now we're talking about an exponentially different way of looking at biology, of looking at chemistry, of looking at proteins. If I think about the way that we discovered drugs three years ago, and don't get me wrong, um, large language models have been used in drug discovery for years now, right? Um, but we just went from, you know, a couple of baby steps, a, a few scientists tinkering to true democratization of discovering drugs in a whole new way, understanding biology in a whole new way. Yep. That, that to me is the most compelling use case right now. I mean, there are many other use cases, but I agree with that. Nima, we were talking right before we started the show a little bit about what else could be generated and some of the downsides of it. Um, your thoughts on um, where do you see that going in the future? Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a good Thing in general, uh, the idea of AI um, is recently took off, uh, but we have had it for a long time. Any student that is uh, trying to learn AI, one of the first things that they learn is an example of detecting a tumor is uh, benign or uh, forgot the other thing, um, malignant. Yeah, um, and and 
that's that's kind of one of the first things that you learn in like computer vision detection in in medicine so uh, it has been around and it has been going on of course this is a double-edged sword uh that as uh, recently there is this there was this model uh this ai that and i'm sorry i'm going to use them interchangeably uh technically they're very different things but in common uh, conversation. I'm going to interchangeably say AI and model. Uh, sorry for that. Um, recently, there has been an AI which, uh, for the same symptoms in a matter of 20 minutes, created 400 different medicine formulas. Now, of course, there is like whole situation they have to go and be approved, so on and so forth, and test it. But the idea of coming up with a formula that is stable and can be tested is something that would take years previously. Of course, as I said, it's a double-edged sword, meaning that there is the other side where there was this other AI which created uh, formulas for fatal poison in a matter uh, of a minute. Yes, 600 of them. But that's that's the thing. Um, we have to use it, and that's why ethics in in AI is also an important factor. Yeah. But one important things I want to mention here is uh, the idea of mul multimodality, which allows AI um, to work in different sorts of data that previously were, were not necessarily compatible like a sound signal which is a wave to a digital one on one and zero or a picture uh which can be yeah rgb pixels again zeros and ones but completely different structure of meaning and an ai that can work with both of them or some of them at the same time. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, discussion mm -hmm. on multimodality. Uh, by the way, I'm going to put everyone's um, LinkedIn profiles uh, uh, in the comment section. Nima is, uh, is, in addition to being a resident scientist at Mobius, he's also a professor of AI. Um, and I love to uh, listen to him and talk to him all the time. Um, most of the world who is just introduced to AI is pretty excited about text. Um, whether it's text to speech or speech to text or large language models only, anything that can be digitized can be modeled, can be simulated, and can be generated. I think it was Google's AlphaGo uh, that was folding uh, proteins, right, to be able to, to bring certain unique things together. Um, Nima, your point around multimodality is interesting. And mixing images, sound, I mean, if you think about the, uh, the, um, the Mayo Clinic use case that I just talked about, um, that sound, right? Um, but you can mix that with text, you can mix that with images as well. Um, last data that I looked at, I think um, if, you're in, uh, if you're in imaging, I think GI, my, my wife's in GI, if you're in imaging, um, a human doctor trained can see about 3% uh, of the polyps in imaging, uh, I think. But with computer vision, um, again, trained models, uh, you're able to see about 20% um, of the polyps, right? Now, that's a massive improvement, but it also changes business models. It mm -hmm. changes legal risk. It changes legal liability. And I'll just put this out there. Five years from now, if you're practicing GI without AI, where you're still bringing that 3% precision to the patients, whereas there's a tool that's a model that could bring 20%, of, of that precision, are you susceptible to malpractice exposure, right? These are the types of conversations now that has to be had as we think through not just the ethics, not just the cultural readiness, but also the implications to the practice of the benefits that we get. Um, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to pick a use case that we want to go through. Right. Um, and there are three different aspects of the conversation here that we are going to get into. Aspect number one, by the way, uh, hope everybody likes our chai. Uh, this was generated by Mid Journey. 
Um, I'll, I'll share the prompt as well in the comments. I thought it was absolutely beautiful art, uh, by the way. Gorgeous. <laughs> so first thing as we think about use cases, and we'll pick a use case here and walk through this. Data mastery. We've all lived in predictive analytics, um, but it's so much more important now to get yeah. data right. Even if it's from Nima's perspective around multimodality, data quality, consent, very interesting. Um, lineage, all that type of good stuff. Model maturity. Um, this is a conversation that I think people are starting to have now. Um, my sense is that models are gonna be commoditized and data is really where the differentiation is gonna be, but there's a lot of discussions around model maturity. Uh, Nima and I hang out, hang out in Hugging Face all the time and are constantly blown away by new models that are popping up every day and then cultural readiness. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Angela, let's talk about the patient having a doctor as a co-pilot. What what yeah. what do you think about that from the perspective of where do we get that data from? Could we master it? What models are out there? Nima, maybe you you touch on the models and I can probably touch on, on cultural net readiness already. So our use case today of Chai with AI on healthcare is patient with a doctor as the co-pilot. Angela. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is such a, a juicy one because um, I'm reading a book and we'll come back to that later, but this, well, first of all, you, you've set up this idea of what if instead of deep fakes that are bad used for nefarious things, we've got deep fakes for good. I mean, that's essentially what you talked about with the, the, you know, Mayo Clinic example. And so, you know, what's another version of that? Well, either the doctor can have a co-pilot in their pocket yeah. or the patient could have a co-pilot in their pocket. And man, there are so many implications to that, right? So first of all, from a, a data perspective, look, uh, we heard all the news, you know, months ago that um, some, of, some of these models and tools can pass, you know, medical exams and things like that. So we believe that these models, these tools are equipped to sort of be that co-pilot. We're, we're mixing performance with capability. Passing, uh, uh, look, I'm very impressed that a model can pass uh, these tests, but yeah. does that mean it could practice? Well, and and look, um, the we all know hallucination is still uh, an ever-present um, factor here, and we still don't understand exactly how those happen. And it's very common for a model, a, a machine learning tool to defend its answer, even if it's wrong. And so because we've learned that, um, there goes the danger side, right? Because I'm a patient and okay, I you know need to understand something about my hypertension. And yes, my co-pilot in my pocket can take me a completely new place in understanding how to manage my blood pressure. And I, by a new place, I mean far beyond Dr. Google now, right? We, right. we let's face it, right? We all use Dr. Google. Um, some There's some ridiculous statistic I can't quote now about how much uh, versus our regular doctors. Um, in some cases, it's gonna be incredibly helpful, useful health literacy, still in the toilet right. globally, right? At the same time, there's the simple example like that. And then there's the example of a doctor who um, who can use that co-pilot to change the way they act with empathy toward a patient, et cetera. But we can't really talk about any of that if we don't talk about the holy spiderweb mess that is healthcare data today. And we hit that topic of data mastery and we start to think about how easy it is to get a longitudinal patient record right now. And so I'm a patient and I'm gonna be starting, there's a lot of stuff I know, there's data everywhere about, you know, about me. Um, but for that co-pilot to be truly effective, how am I gonna train the yeah. model for me, Yeah. right? Yeah. How am I gonna find the, the data mastery? Forget consent, we don't even need to go to consent today, right? But how do I even think about training a model personally for me, because isn't that really where it's at when we take this next leap? Like, yeah. is it good enough to just be able to do sort of, you know, 
correlatory things based on the population that I might be stratified against. We've right. been able to do lookalike models for patients for years. Right. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd love to hear sort of what you guys see yeah. from the model perspective. Well, I'm going to pass it to Nima in a second to talk, to talk about models. I think that, look, when I was in healthcare, all the questions that you just asked, Angela, we've been asking it for a while. How am I going to get a longitudinal patient record? How am awesome. I going to get, um, you know, integrated data? How am I going to get personalized data, et cetera? When we were asking those questions five, 10 years ago, it was sort of like um, asking the questions because it's, it's kind of like you understand that there is probably going to be some value in the data, but the value that was going to come from the data was not well defined. I think right. what's different about today is that the examples that we're seeing where artificial intelligence is being used to drive real value now makes the questions no longer just a pontificating exercise, but a real productionized exercise because now we've got you know, the, the promise of real personalization and real value that can be driven. Um, and by the way, personalization all the way through the value chain Rich, because it's it's not just personalization the way we used to talk about it. Can I personalize a message to a patient to get them to show up and pick up that prescription? No, no. We're talking about can I personalize the drug I'm discovering all the way over here, yeah. all the way through, right? So that to me is is mind blowing stuff. I think so. So we pro one of the things that I like to do. Um, I've shared some videos before of my opinion spectrum right about about ai where you've got everything from alarmists to optimists and pessimists and realists the other thing i like to do is just to remind everyone that this journey that we're going on this sort of all of us as a species this is a 10k marathon and we're about the 300 meter mark right exactly. so some of the things that we're seeing today that that we're thinking yeah but that's too far out um, if you think 10, 20 years out, you can start to see how those things will come to life. Yeah. And it'll take five to six years for a drug manufacturer to get there anyway. So while I feel like there's a, there's a hurry up arms race in the market right now, and it is, there's some really, really good benefit that you could get from a customer service perspective or from a cost reduction perspective or automation or augmentation perspective. Um, the real benefits are still probably half a decade to a decade away where we're going to start to see impact in business models. Nima, I wanted to talk a little bit about model maturity and you and I have talked a little bit before multiple times around hallucination and whether it yep. was by design or it's a bug. Um, mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about, and I know you're, you're, you understand this way more than I do, why does hallucination happen and why it will be difficult to be able to remove it completely? And then we could talk a little bit about how do we learn to actually navigate around hallucination? Yeah, sure. So uh, just for uh, everybody's benefit, hallucinations is when the model is giving a weird output. That's, that's a very broad, uh, uh definition of it um so everybody who is watching this video can go and search for ai hallucinations and then you will see like to chat gpd you input the specific text and it gives this um, completely out of context responses and uh, so on and so forth but that hallucination, amongst other things, going to a study in ai uh, which is called uh, ai safety now, the, the whole pr uh, premise of AI saf safety goes into the factor that goes into the reasoning of that AI is a computer software that is trying to give you the best output mm -hmm. and get the better, better, let's say, reward out of it. You say, hey, hurrah, good, good job. Um, so if, for example, and this is, this is not something that is like necessarily specific for AI, but it is one of the biggest problems of AI is the, when you, for example, when you're talking to a child, 
you say, hey, why did you do that? And they will come up with an idea and usually very creative ideas of why they did that while you know it's not true. So an AI will try to give you an outcome instead of trying to give you, instead of telling you, I don't know, because I don't know ends in less candy for it. Uh, that's, that's one thing. There is another whole conversation of trying to differentiate between the answer of, I don't know the answer, or I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, so these are all the things that, uh, and amongst, again, a lot of things, uh, there is a whole Wikipedia page about uh, AI safety and how AI and where AI actually tried to weasel out his, his way out of like a, a answer or try to um, find a loophole that, for example, a human being wouldn't even think of doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there is like this example of um, if you have a, a robot that uh, you give it a directive of clean my house and says, okay, what is clean? It says, wherever you cannot detect any garbage from your streaming stream feed, uh, that is, uh, the house is clean. So the, the, the robot just puts a bucket over its head. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> like it gets the best clean. outcome. <laughs> yeah, right. and very fast. Yeah. So. Yeah, because the loss function on that is absolutely uh, yeah, low. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, so, so there is overfeeding, the, underfeeding, so on and so forth. So, leave, yeah. leave it up to a professor to um, explain um, uh, statistics uh, using a child and candy. Um, so, so great job. Uh, what I found interesting, and I think um, it was a gentleman by the name of Michael Wu, I think, who did a did a video that kind of explained the standard deviation and the bell curve and mm -hmm. how what we believe is a bug is actually the design of certain generative models and to Nima's point it has to provide an answer it's not designed to say I don't know um, and the example there was you know uh, what's the color of the sky and and it, when you look at the math and you look at the model and you look at the weights what you realize is that the AI has many answers it could give you blue, gray, red, white, orange, if it's, if it's a sunset. And what it's really doing is it's calculating the statistical probability based on the prompt or the context mm -hmm. to give you the right answer. So if you just say, what's the color of the sky? Let's say blue. Well, what we don't see is that there was black that had a lower statistical probability than gray, which had a mm -hmm. higher statistical probability than orange. We only see the blue. Right? right. And so that's why this whole idea of performance versus competency is something that we're going to have to really wrestle with to understand. Because when you realize that it was just a list of colors and blue had the highest statistical probability, suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, this thing can't think. Oh, yeah, this is just math. Right. It's not going to take over the world because it's mathematical programming. Now, the whole taking over the world conversation from the alarmist point of view, that depends on how we use it. Like math's not dangerous. How we use math can be dangerous. What I think would be interesting here is if when these generative models come back with an answer, they provide a statistical representation of the confidence around the answer. So imagine if I'm having a conversation with you Nima and I are working on some conversational AI where um, you know we're creating this this notion of presence and personhood and regenerating you after train after you're being trained, where um, we want to ask you a question, right? So I'm I'm dealing with Angela that AI. So Angela, how are things going? You know, with blah blah blah, and when the answer comes back, right now the pattern of AI is it just says here's the answer. Imagine if Angela at AI says, here's the answer. By the way, I'm only 35% confident on that answer. That's where I think we can start to navigate around the, what is an underlying design function of these models to have to give us an answer. Because now you know the answer is not that good, right? Okay, because well, it was a 35% confidence. This is compelling. 
but I think what you're doing is in some ways you're also introducing from a cultural readiness perspective, this topic of there's another scale that we don't have yet, right? So you might be an alarmist to an optimist, but think about all the people who are gonna pick up a tool and score or no score, um, they are going to wanna just use it as is. So we're gonna have a scale of people, we're gonna have high human in the loop, people, people who understand, trust, but verify, trust, but verify, right? And, or, and maybe there's a, you know, somebody even further on the spectrum who is, is beyond trust, but verify. They're going to be the type of person like my husband who wants to have dueling GPSs in the car, like the one on his phone and the one on the car and the, right? Because he's got to see which direction's right. And I'm like, and, and still won't follow it by the way, right. <laughs> still won't follow GPS, right? So they're going to pe be people on that end of the spectrum. And then we're gonna have people on the complete other end of the spectrum who are going to be willing to use a tool and trust it as is, um, especially in situations they perceive as low risk situations. So I do think we, we need to think about like, when you say, oh, I'm a, I have that score, I'm gonna look at that score. You, Nima and I are the type of people who we're looking for that score. Right. And not only are we looking for the score, we wanna know what's behind the score. We wanna understand the statistical probability. We want the transparency of the model in our face so we can decide how much we can trust and how much we need to verify. Right. But there are people whose literacy um, is going to be so far below that, that something that is going to be this accessible to us as a human species. Right. Um, Exactly. It's really, it's a compelling thing to think about, Richie. So I'm glad you introduced it. Yeah. Well, if I may, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very important factor. Thanks, Angela. Uh, firstly, in general, uh, from um, uh, studies, we know that human beings are not very good at understanding statistics in mm -hmm. general. We are not good at that. But at the same time, uh, many of these what ifs come into play necessarily because we are at that uh, point in our uh, technological advancement that we can afford to ask them. Mm -hmm. So uh, from the, the study in uh, autonomous uh, vehicles uh, in general, like self-driving cars, I remember we were talking that like there was papers that were talking about, okay, if the if the car is driving and then there is a, a, a bus coming full of children, should it try to, oh, and yeah. there is no other way to uh, save those children other than run you off of a cliff, mm -hmm. should it try right. to save those or should it try to save your, you as a driver? You see, that question has come in play because we can afford to ask it. So mm -hmm. that is where I think the cultural, uh, cultural readiness is one of the biggest important most important factors but there are many other things that we are right now doing with ai we can do with ai mm -hmm. before we have to ne necessarily think about it because honestly at this point even a, uh, a the best human doctor cannot necessarily know everything about everything right, yeah. that exists this, at their disposal. This is a fascinating conversation. I was, uh, I was talking about um, errors that, that mm. could be made. Um, I, I forgot the statistic. I think it's 250,000. Um, if I get it wrong, somebody just get it right in the comments. 250,000 people die from some sort of malpractice, some sort of healthcare malpractice annually. I believe it's in the US. I don't know if it's global or not. We'll find the right stats on that. Mm -hmm. So it's not like humans don't make mistakes, right? right. It's, it's, not like, it's not like in that paper, you know, we've never had someone drive a car and, you know, and mm -hmm. run into someone and kill them. Um, what's really interesting about AI is the accountability of it and where does that liability mm -hmm. fall? Right. Uh, yeah. um, so, so, so if if you are driving um, one of Musk's Teslas, and uh, and you knock someone over, um, who, who's at risk? Um, is it the car manufacturer? Is it the AI manufacturer? And so now you think about a business model where maybe Mercedes has the most sophisticated, uh, you know, autonomous driving 
model and their new business model is they're leasing that intelligence to all the rest of cars and they become an insurance company because now you have to underwrite that risk under yeah. some form of actuarial, right? So when we think about cultural readiness and cultural literacy, specifically around AI, you cannot ignore the notion of business models, right? Business yeah. models are going to change for good uh, and for the worst. Right? That's right. Um, I wanted to introduce a, a conversation about a business model. Now, this one's probably going to surprise you guys. I know you didn't you didn't get a prep for this coming in. Um, my 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 father was a, 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 is an agriculturist, and I grew up grafting plants. I've grafted all sorts of interesting fruits and created stuff that's delicious and stuff that nobody should eat. And this is a science by itself, right? Um, creating unique plants, a personalized seed, so to speak, is possible because the data about a plant is digitizable. It could be simulated, could be replicated, could be generated. So in some ways, um, I believe we're going to get to a point where we're going to be able to tune the plant for consumption, for eating, right? Where we can really build foods that are now personalized to your biological, biological predispositions, right? What do you guys think about the healthcare industry and the agriculture industry merging together to create a whole new class of food and a whole new class of care where now the food is personalized based on your disease disposition because we're able to model you and model the plant at the same time and, and everything else that's moving in that direction if we think about you know manufactured meat and all this type of stuff and all the farm to table uh, uh, aspects of culture how does that sound does that sound like a better version of the world well i think <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> uh, you see, you're getting into uh, the area, you know, I'm excited about in general singularity. Um, um, but th th and that, that's a that's a very uh, good uh, example. I think I, I am going to give <laughs> to my students from now on of multimodality. Mm. Uh, oh, it's a whole is... different form of multimodality, right? Because it, it, could, it could it still is. be it could still be um, protein or molecular structure, which is still the same modality, but the fact that it comes from unusual subsets of data, right? This, to yeah. me, this is where you break the math, where one plus one yeah. is no longer two, but one plus one is equal to three. Actually, what you're talking about kind of uh, um, puts another angle to, like I can say exactly the same thing that you said in another angle about a uh, music generation that helps your psyche. Right, you know? right, right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, imagine the agriculture AI exists. There is models, there is AIs that uh, are growing plants with better performances, uh, stuff like that. There is medicine. Um, now we have better power. Now, by the way, one other aspect of the whole conversation is that now we have uh, infrastructure and hardware that can parse and analyze the data way, way, way faster than what we right. had like 10 years ago. Mm. So having that in mind, we have agriculture figured out. And of course, we're excelling in that. There is medicine and uh, to Angela's point, personal medicine um and then uh these two feeding into each other yeah that's that's fascinating and your um, thoughts? there's there's so many uh things running through my head first of all you know there's a there's a couple of big pharma players in the space who i'll you know keep nameless um given all my affiliations but i'm sure you can guess right who had the vision that food and medicine belong together but their vision was not this. Their vision was um, nutrition, yep. and mm. nutrition right affects our 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 physical state. Um, and maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they did have this vision, and and we're about to see a sea change. Um, so I think about that, and I think okay, that's you know because you brought up business models, Rich, and I thought you know yeah, what does this what does this do to business models? On the flip side, 
I think about people like me who go to their acupuncturists and uh, herbal medicine specialists as much as they go to a traditional doctor. And I think that there is um, this awareness within us inherently as humans that everything that we need for our health has been put around us in the environment, an environment we don't take great care of. Um, but wow, like if, if we could have, a, instead of our patio plants being, uh, you know, mini tomatoes and basil, um, it could be what we need to stay optimally healthy. Like that's a pretty magical combination. But what's per most personal, magical? Personalized seeds. Personalized seeds, right? Personalized that still seeds. tastes good. That still tastes good, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Thank I'll, I'll you. take that chocolate to Earl Grey uh, <laughs> apple, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And or and it's even too. I, I don't know. Maybe it's something about this idea of having the ability to cultivate our own health and wellness with with the tools we have to to also keep our children healthy. Uh, I think about all the places in the world that previously had trouble growing things at all, and now that's very different because of the leaps we have made in agricultural science. Where Nima, to the example you brought up there are apps now that tell farmers how much water to put and yeah. all of this. So putting aside all of the fun controversy that's going to come up around genetically modified medicine, forget genetically modified uh, food and how we should label it. The potential here is not just interesting, but what has changed in the last year is that it's not just something we can see in 20 years. It's something that we can see sort of on our doorstep. So, so question for you and <laughs> ask you a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So because you're talking about culture readiness, one of the issues in general with, with food, mm. one of the issues with food is that you do not see the outcome right away. Like if I go in chat GPT type a prompt right now, mm. you will see the outcome right away. And mm. that's why everybody is so excited about it. Right. Yeah. But right. imagine having a, a, a medicine that uh, a food slash medicine that is designed for your well-being and you will see the result in a month or two. Right. So uh, the, the old adage, adage of, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away needs to be amended that says, if you could remove hedonism, by all means, that would work. <laughs> right? um, so, so folks, this conversation can go on forever. Um, yeah. I do want to just take us back through memory lane here. Um, chai for AI or chai with AI. That's our that's our our conversation here today. Um, we're talking specifically healthcare. Angela, I want to thank you um, for joining Nima and I. Um, Nima, thank you for um, you know kind of going with the flow uh, here uh, um, in a topic that you might not be completely aware um, or familiar with. Um, this feels to me like the three pillars of consideration. Whether you're on a board, you're in C-suite, you're a data scientist, data mastery, model maturity, and cultural readiness, and and there are many different ways to describe this. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, the success of any company's ability to use artificial intelligence is going to come down to trust. It's going to come down to can the person that is receiving the augmentation rely on it for the mm -hmm. same types of SLAs that we get from a sophisticated or, or, or a permissioned human, right? Um, I love this conversation about business models. What excites me beyond the notion of data and the notion of model and the notion of culture readiness is the business models that are gonna emerge from this. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that within the next 20 years, one of the top 20 pharma companies is gonna transform completely into a farming company. You get it, pharma to farming. Um, yeah. That's our conversation on healthcare. Ange, again, thank you for your time. Nima, thank you for your time. Until next time.